You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Randall Holcomb of Florida State University. Randall, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. No, thanks a lot for inviting me. I'm delighted to be talking with you. So our topic for today is political capitalism. Uh, Randall has written a book of that name uh, entitled Political Capitalism, How Economic and Political Power is Made and Maintained. Um, So, Randall, uh, how how about you start by just uh, defining what you mean by political capitalism? You chose it as the, the title of your book, and I think different people might think of different things when they hear those words together. So uh, so let's start with a nice, clear definition. Okay, uh, thank you. I've, I have received many comments, both positive and negative, about the title. The way I'm looking at mm-hmm. political capitalism, it's an economic and political system in which the economic and political elite cooperate for their mutual benefit. And in that system, the profitability of business is determined more by political connections rather than by satisfying consumer preferences. So uh, it's uh, one way to think about it, cronyism, crony capitalism. Okay. So it's sort of the the idea of uh, regulatory capture, of uh, maybe uh, lobbying leading to political benefits for well-connected individuals. Is that sort of, that's the gist then? Uh, Absolutely. That's the gist. And, and basically, I think, People, a lot of people recognize the system. Uh, they they see it for what it is. They it's cronyism. They call it corporatism, favoritism, fascism in Nazi Germany is an example. President Eisenhower warned about the military industrial complex. So a lot of people recognize the system, uh, but not that many people understand it. Mm, okay, so so and and so it's describing. A lot of parts of our, our world today, right? So it's not theoretical, and it's definitely not prescriptive. It's it's trying to describe the you know the the economy and the political system that we see in the United States and potentially in in other countries today. Uh, wh- what would you say uh, are are systems that really you know fit the definition of political capitalism? Well, you see it to a degree in just about every country. Um, South Korea is a good example of uh, political capitalism, industrial policy in Japan, uh, even in the United States. Uh, you see a, a lot of that interaction between the political elite and the economic elite. So I, I don't think you can really look at any system and say this is pure political capitalism. And maybe the closest we've come is, is Nazi Germany. So in a sense, the, the book is more of a warning. This is where we might be headed, so watch out. Uh, instead of an observation, this is where we are. So you are a public choice economist. Um, do, do you want to, uh, does, does this uh, book fit into, um, you know, the, the research agenda of people like uh, Buchanan and Tulloch, uh, the pol- political, the uh, public choice school? Of economics? Yeah, absolutely, it does. One thing that motivated me to write the book is I think a lot of people see the symptoms of political capitalism, but not that many people understand what's behind it. And one of the things I discuss in the book is that there's a really strong theoretical foundation for political capitalism already. And I see that in two different strands of literature that haven't really been well connected. And one is public choice. Uh, you look at public choice, the rent seeking, the regulatory capture, uh, the, um, constant, the, the ability of concentrated special interests to uh, uh, work the political process for their uh, for their advantage, uh, as opposed to the, the general public interest. So public choice theory, there are a lot of elements of public choice theory that explain how some people can benefit through the political system at the expense of others. And then uh, there's another strand of literature, and this is more in sociology and political science, elite theory. Uh, and it's been developed throughout the 20th century, the idea that there are an elite few people who um, 
basically make the rules, control the political process, uh, and the masses are subject to the, to the rules, subject to the institutions that are designed by the elite. So that elite theory explains who benefits, and public choice uh, theory explains how they benefit from that connection between the economic and political elite. I mean, but public choice theory, when you look at rent seeking, for example, the theory shows, you know, some people capture rents, other people uh, pay the price for those rents. But what public choice theory doesn't explain is there is a systematic group, one group of people who always get the rents, one group of people who always capture the regulatory agencies. That's the elite. Hmm. I, I wonder, though, if, you know, if somebody started capturing rents who hadn't before, would we then sort of start to recognize them as, as elite? I, isn't there potential that, uh, you know, ex post, you can look at someone who has successfully manipulated the system to enrich themselves? Uh, wouldn't you then just recognize them ex post as, re- as elite, thus making it a little bit unfalsifiable? Um, or, or is there something, some specific thing that we can identify someone as elite that doesn't just, uh, you know, automatically rope in everyone who, who is rich and powerful? Well, um, I, you know, I, I think there's something to what you're saying, that uh, if we see people who are getting those benefits, those people are, are part of the elite. So eh, you might look at it as tautological, but here's here's another aspect uh, that I that I discuss, and it gets it gets a little bit theoretical. So economists and political scientists will catch on to this quickly, I think. But but it's important for the general public to see that there are a few people. There are necessarily a few people who make public policy. Those are people who can bargain with each other. That starts with the legislature. Uh, there are, uh, uh, there's a small number of people in the legislature. They can bargain with each other. There are some well-connected lobbyists. They can enter the bargaining process. And uh, if you're an economist, you can understand this within the context of the Coase theorem, that the people who make public policy are people who face low transaction costs. Those are people in the legislature who can bargain with each other. Those are well-connected lobbyists who face low transaction costs. They bargain with each other. They make public policy. Most people face high transaction costs. They really don't have anything to say about public policy. I'll include myself in that group. Uh, if I if I want to have some impact on public policy, I see some counterproductive pub, uh, public policy. I want something changed. I really have no influence to do it. Uh, And if you think about it in that context, some people face low transaction costs. They bargain to make public policy. Other people face high transaction costs. They're unable to influence public policy. It's well-connected people always who are able to design public policy for their benefit. So one way to think about it, is to divide the population up into people who face low transaction costs, like legislators, well-connected lobbyists, and most people who face high transaction costs. Now, thinking about it in the context of the Coase theorem like that, this was kind of a new way to think about it. But if you go back in history, this idea is well-recognized. Uh, Marx and Engels talked about the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Uh, that elite theory talked about elites and masses. And more recently in the 21st century, you look at the Occupy Wall Street movement, they're talking about the 1% and the 99%. So when you look at it that way, the, the bourgeoisie, the elite, the 1%, those are people who face low transaction costs and they make public policy. Uh, the proletariat, the masses, the 99%, those are people who face high transaction costs. They have to settle for the public policy that's designed by the elite. Right. Okay. So when you're talking about transaction costs in this scenario, you, you mean the, the cost of communicating with, with you know, political representatives or, or the, the holders of political power, bargaining with them. So if I'm someone who uh has a, a close friend or or a brother or someone who who is a, you know a, a senator or 
uh, works on the the president's staff or something, you know, then maybe maybe my ability to uh, you know to complain or to to be heard or to even affect policy is much higher than someone who doesn't have any kind of personal connection. Is is that sort of the what what you're picturing in terms of transaction costs in this context? Uh, that's exactly the idea, and uh, there's a difference between political power and economic power. There's a continuity in economic power that you don't find in political power. That um, a, a dollar, my dollar, pulls just as much weight in the economy as Warren Buffett's dollar. Now he has more dollars than I do, so he has more economic power, but. There's a continuity in economic power. Let's say that you're in a low-paying job and you're thinking, yeah, I'd, I'd like to have a little more economic power. You can work some overtime. Maybe you can get a second job. Maybe you can build your skills so you can get a little bit of a higher paying job. You work a little harder. You work a little longer. You gain a little bit more economic power. But there's a discontinuity in political power. See, in economic power, if you have $10, you got twice as much economic power as somebody with $5. If you got $10 million, you got 10 times the economic power as somebody with a million dollars. But with political power, you know, unlike the, with economic power, work a little harder, work some overtime, gain more economic power. If you're in the masses, if you have no political power, you can volunteer for a political campaign. Uh, maybe you can make some contributions to uh, to a candidate or to a party, but you'll still have no political power. Of course, if you, I mean, if you make huge contributions, then you can uh, uh, lower the transaction costs and become a part of the elite. But just for the ordinary man in the street, you work a little harder, you gain a little more economic power. You, uh, but in politics volunteer to work for a candidate, send in a campaign contribution, you still have no political power. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a sort of minimum, you have your one vote, right? So that there's, there's a, a minimum amount of political power, which is you, you don't influence anyone. You don't directly communicate with, with anyone who sets policy. You, you know, you're not, your voice isn't heard. But uh, at the same time, you you get it, you can go to the voting booth and uh, have this minuscule chance of changing which candidate wins uh, once every four years. So not not a not a huge impact um, is and that's and that's very very different from having a, having a direct line to to the people in power. Uh, whereas if you if you had money you you could uh, you know a, a, a hundred families you know w- wanting to buy apartments can outbid a single family that wants a mansion for for a c- certain plot of land right yeah but you don't see that in politics I mean in politics you do have your one vote but your one vote isn't going to affect the outcome of the election I mean if you think about the last presidential election in the United States. If you had voted for Donald Trump, who would be president today? Trump. If you had voted for Hillary Clinton, who would be president today? Trump. If you hadn't voted at all, who would be president today? Trump. And, you know, every voter has to know that. I mean, voters talk about being patriotic and participating, and indeed they do. But they have no incentive to be informed. They have no incentive to cast an informed vote. Economists and political scientists refer to this as rational ignorance. It, you know, it pays you to know the difference between various restaurants because it makes a difference to the quality of your meal. But it really doesn't pay you anything at all to gain any knowledge about politics or political candidates because your one vote isn't going to change the outcome of the election. Uh, voters are rationally ignorant. Uh, rationally ignorant because their vote doesn't have an impact. And that rational ignorance is a manifestation of the fact that they know they have no political power. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, I'm sympathetic to the view. Uh, uh, yeah. The, I mean, people, people do, although we, we think they should be rationally ignorant, it seems like people have a disproportionate interest in, uh, in politics despite their lack of influence on it uh you know maybe it's just a you know a, a something that interests people 
they they don't they don't always do things that uh that benefit them you know people people uh watch television shows and those d- aren't you know no knowing the details of a television show isn't going to uh increase your income but of course they they do it because it's entertaining and in a similar way politics can be entertainment um yeah i mean yeah. people follow politics some people follow politics the way other people follow sports and you know yeah. you know you're you you know all the players on your team and you know what's going on. People are interested in sports. Some people are, other people aren't. Um, the same thing with politics. Some people are interested, other people aren't. But I think uh, for a lot of people who, as you say, follow follow politics, uh, they – they they aren't following it, thinking about, as you said, what's in their own interest. Um, a lot of times, uh, well, you know, for example, people will think the Democratic Party, There, there's a party that looks out for other people. It's a caring party. I feel like I'm a caring person. Therefore, I'm going to vote Democrat. Um, other people, uh, you know, they'll look at the world and, and they'll think, you know, people – uh, need to be self sufficient. They need to they they need to take care of themselves. Uh, individual freedom is a very important thing. Uh, to have an economy working well, you need to have minimal government oversight over the economy. They'll vote Republican, but a lot of times that's a, an emotional response rather than thinking through what's in my best interest or what's in the best interest of the country. Mm. Yeah, and um, you know you don't e- even if you could get a lot of your friends together to vote one way or another, and you were potentially going to swing the election, you still just choose one of these big bundles. Uh, you know, you, you don't, you don't really get to pick, you know, the individual, you know, lot go line by line through the tax code or, or, uh, you know, affect individual regulations. You just kind of get to pick these, these big, you one party or the other. And if the package they don't give you is not something you like, or the package they give you is not something you like. You you can't necessarily affect individual parts of it. Uh, pick and choose what you like and don't like. Sure, um, and, and mm-hmm. a lot of times uh, people just vote based on emotional reasons. I mean, you know, all my friends are voting for the Democrats. My friends tell me the Democratic Party that's the nice party, that's the caring party. I'm a caring person. Therefore, I'm going to vote Democrat. It's really nothing particularly about the policies or the effect of the policies. It's just, you, you know, you think about yourself, you think about your peer group in a particular way, and that influences the way you vote. And unlike choosing where what restaurant to go to, you know, it, it has no ultimate material effect on your life whatsoever. So you make an emotional vote, um, what uh, economists and political scientists refer to as expressive voting rather than instrumental voting. Uh, are, are you are you familiar with um any empirical research uh sort of showing how political influence can make uh individuals or companies you know af- affect how well certain companies do or or any research connecting this sort of political influence with you know the the economy and and who wins and who loses? Um, no, I don't know of any empirical research along the, those lines. Uh, there may be some, but I'm not familiar with any. Mm. Okay. I, so I did see a paper, I believe it was presented at the Public Choice Society, and it looked at a situation where there was a recount in, uh, in the Senate, and it flipped the party, and they they showed that companies that had given money to to one party or you know, their stock price rose and the other ones, uh, they they fell showing quite, quite a significant swing. So I, I, I don't recall exactly who that was, but I'll look it up and, and, uh, maybe send it to you and post it, uh, when I post this episode. But I, I do think there's, there's some research supporting this idea that having political connections, donating to candidates and getting those candidates or their party elected does have some impact on, on how how well com- companies function which which really help helps your your thesis that of uh, you know political capitalism and this interaction effect between the economy and politics 
Yeah, that, that's interesting. I would be interested to see any any research along those lines. I mean, one thing you find if you look at political contributions of corporations is they tend to contribute to both parties, both candidates. You know, mm. so I mean, you look down the list of their contributions. They'll contribute to Republicans. They'll contribute to Democrats. They're just trying to cover their bases on all sides. Right. So in in that view, they they'd be more purchasing access uh, than specifically trying to swing towards one policy or a agenda or another. It, it's not that for a company that gives equally to both parties, it's not that they do it because one party is particularly better. It's because they want to perhaps uh, threaten to not give donations next year. Um, if, uh, if, you know, their, their particular, the particular regulations and policies that affect them are not favorable to them. Sure. And, and uh, as you said, uh, you, you want to purchase access. So it's not necessarily that you're trying to promote a particular policy, although you may be, you know, looking for tax breaks or subsidies or whatever, but you want to have access so that if something comes up in, uh, in the legislature that's going to affect your business, you're able to stop in and you already have access. And, and there's a huge connection there's a, a there's a really good book by Peter Schweitzer called Extortion, and I recommend it to public choice people to read because he talks it's 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 um, stories uh, facts about uh, here's how the political process works, but uh, you know basically if you can get your foot in the door if you can talk to a legislator, the way those conversations tend to run, you know that you'll a lobbyist will come in maybe he's trying to get some favorable policy for his company. Uh, you know, we want a tax break or we want a subsidy, or maybe he's trying to prevent legislation that's going to harm his company. There's some regulation they're considering or a new tax that, that, that they're considering. And the legislature, the legislator will say, uh, yeah, well, you know, we're, we're probably going to take that up next week. We're thinking about that. Oh, and by the way, I'm having a reception for my political action committee or my reelection campaign or something, you know, it's coming up next week. Uh, and I'd love it if you could attend. And what that means is the lobbyist better attend. And when you go to those receptions, there's, there's a bowl in the middle of the room. And when, when you go in, you're supposed to deposit your check into the bowl and, uh, the, the legislators aides keep track of who's putting the checks in. And if you put a check in, you're likely to get favorable treatment. And uh, if you don't show up at the reception or you don't put your check in, could be bad news for you. So, I mean, there's a, you know, a definite purchase of access. Uh, and well, what Peter Schweitzer uh, calls it, he calls it extortion. Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's quite shocking that it's so, so blatant. I think we, I don't know. I, I always kind of hope that it's, uh, I don't know um, that people are mostly well-meaning or, or that to the extent that they're corrupt, they are in, in maybe subtle ways. Maybe they don't believe they're corrupt, but they're just subtly biased towards doing things that, uh, that benefit themselves and their friends. But, uh, you know, to, to actually have a very sort of explicit uh, or I guess, uh, you know, thinly veiled system of effectively bribery is um is is a surprise yeah. yeah and and schweitzer in his book you know his book is titled extortion and he says a lot of times we think these lobbyists are trying to bribe legislators uh and he looks at it the other way he says actually what appears like bribery really is extortion it's not the lobbyists trying to bribe the legislators it's the legislators extorting payments from the lobbyists, but really, I mean, there's a, a, a number of accounts of former uh, legislators who have talked about how ever-present fundraising is in their jobs. I mean, as soon as you get elected, you're out fundraising both for yourself for re-election and also for your party. Uh, and uh, the parties uh, look at the fundraising of legislators and are, are tend to be more charitable toward legislators in their party when they raise a lot of money. So fundraising, I mean, that's just uh, one of the things that comes with the job. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, 
I think most of us probably look at politicians and think what we see them doing is their job. You know, they're voting on legislation, they're they're debating it. Uh, you know, but uh, but yeah, so much of what they actually do is try to raise funds for the next election. Can't really blame them because that is the the incentive they face. Uh, but it's uh, maybe maybe not ideal. So I wanted to uh, to talk about how um you know we mentioned uh Tulloch and Buchanan as influences on this work but uh you you actually um they did not really believe in the idea of of one class of people uh sort of oppressing another which is where you break from from sort of their thought w- what would be you know Buchanan or Tulloch's objection you think to to um to your work if they if they were going to uh disagree well i i don't know that's a that's a good question uh in the calculus of consent that was co-authored by buchanan and tulloch they have a passage in there where they explicitly reject that idea of elites and masses of one group oppressing another group uh and partly i think it's the general approach that they take in the calculus of consent uh in the calculus of consent uh well one thing I've, that buchanan has said a lot is is uh that uh, he looks at public choice as uh, sort of analyzing politics as exchange and the idea especially in the calculus of consent some things we can accomplish through markets, uh, through um, uh, individual transactions, but there are other things that really require uh, us to, to get together collectively uh, to produce what we want. You know, highways might be an example of something like that. And so they take that politics as exchange approach where we can look at markets and individual exchange in markets where everybody benefits. But sometimes we need to get together and make collective decisions where we all benefit. And so that politics as exchange approach, you know, looks at at everybody benefiting from collective action uh, as opposed to one group oppressing another or one group taking advantage of another group. So that's in the Calculus of Consent, which was published in 1962, where they explicitly say that. But if you look at some of their later work, they move away from that. Now, Tulloch, especially when you look at, at uh, rent seeking, the rent seeking idea that uh, Tulloch uh, worked on quite a bit. I mean, clearly, there are some people are using the system to the advantage of others. And in Buchanan's book, The Limits of Liberty, that was published in 1975, you know, he, he refers back to the calculus of, of consent and the way they were looking at the politics as exchange. But then he recognizes Sometimes people are using the political system for their own advantage. So, you know, clearly what I'm doing in that in my book uh, is somewhat at odds with what's in the calculus of consent and at odds with the idea of politics as exchange. But you can look in at some of the later work of Buchanan and Tulloch, especially Tulloch, and and see that he he has this idea of some people using the political system for the advantage of others. What I don't see in Tulloch, though, is that class, the elites versus masses, the 1% versus the 99%. And that's what elite theory adds to what Tulloch brought to the table. Mm. Okay, so you view it more as sort of, a, you know, build, building on top of uh, of their, their later work then. Um, and yeah and i i agree that uh that it it's not incompatible with with most of what they they wrote uh just uh just that one statement in calculus of consent but then elsewhere it's tulloch really does sort of seem to have a view of of there being as sort of more of an uh, elite class controlling the state and and of course there's this argument in public choice always that uh you know, a concentrated special interest will um, be able to sort of negotiate things for their benefit uh, against the interest of a dispersed public. And I think that sort of ties into your your ideas of transaction costs that really be ha- having a concentrated interest and in having a small number of vi- individuals with this interest is sort of a 
it's it's something that's correlated with low transaction costs. Uh, obviously, the more people you need to talk to to get a coalition together to affect some change, the the harder it's going to be. So getting getting five people together is easy. Getting a million together is difficult. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and and if you look at um, Buchanan and Tullock's later work. I think Tulloch definitely has the darker picture of politics, and Buchanan remains somewhat of an optimist all the way through. I mean, he's after the limits of liberty, picks up on this idea of constitutional political economy, and is talking about constitutional rules where, in principle anyway, everybody would agree, uh, you know, how we can design constitutional rules so that they benefit everybody. Uh, and you see that in Buchanan's work all the way through his work, whereas Tulloch has a little bit um, darker view of the way the political process works. Buchanan's more hopeful. Mm -hmm. A lot of, I was, I'm always surprised by how much of the early public choice work is effectively ideal theory uh, in a sense, you know, that, that uh, they talk about uh, the idea of designing a constitution uh, or you know designing meta level rules that could uh you know get the the ideal outcome and and just uh you know it sort of uh pe- people have worried about um an infinite regress where okay you know yeah but who who designs the constitutional rules you know who who's going to agree to these if uh if some people are doing really well under the current meta rules and uh you know it it uh that's always been sort of a complaint about public choice that, um, you know, when economists are talking about try, just trying to inform policy and tell people what the best policies are, you know, there's a clear role for economists. Maybe we could be one of the groups that has some sway over policy and we could direct it for the good. But if you take a step back and say, well, the policymakers, they also have their incentives and they're going to behave this way according to those incentives, then, you know, what, what, uh, what good is saying that, you know, you've described what the problem is, but, uh, but it, in under, under your assumptions where people are following their incentives and those incentives take them to bad places, you know, how is pointing this out going to result in a, a better outcome? Yeah. And, and Buchanan has some answers to that. I mean, Buchanan says if, we design constitutional rules so that they apply equally to everybody. Everybody's covered by the rules. That gives you more of an incentive to, to design productive rules. And also, if the rules are sufficiently durable, Buchanan says, then if looking way out into the future, you're really not sure exactly how the rules are going to affect you in specific circumstances. So you have an incentive to, to uh, design general rules that benefit everybody. And it's really, it's taken that long run view versus the short run view. And so I guess the pessimistic answer to Buchanan's optimism is, you know, he's, he's looking at designing durable long run rules, whereas people involved in the political process are interested in short run benefits that, that give them uh, those benefits immediately. Hmm. Right, right. As if you take a, a longer run approach, you you uh, things maybe maybe look a little more positive when you're diagnosing all the ailments of society. It, it can seem like there's no way to to fix things, but uh, but maybe over over a longer time frame, uh, cer- certainly over you know the course of a, a lifetime, um, there's there can be some pretty big uh, level changes in in the way politics work and and societies function. Um, well, if, if the rules are durable enough, maybe you have an incentive to favor rules that, that benefit everybody. And in uh, an article by Buchanan back in the 60s, he had an interesting example to, to think about, which is using traffic lights uh, to regulate traffic. Uh, so, you know, so let's say you pull up to a red light. So you come up to a red light, you stop at the light, There's no other traffic coming. There's no conflict. It imposes a short-run cost on you that you have to stop for the red light. 
And so, you know, does that mean that you're against the traffic lights? Uh, and so the constitutional political co economy answer is, no, overall, you benefit from that system of traffic lights that regulates the flow of traffic for the benefit of everybody. So even though there are short run costs that are imposed on you sometimes, like when you have to stop at a red light and there's no opposing traffic, overall, you benefit from the rule that says you stop at the red lights and you have the right of way at, uh, in green lights. So the, the traffic lights, that's kind of an analogy for Buchanan's constitutional rules. In the short run, you might bear some costs, but overall you benefit from the rules. Now, I think that may be overly optimistic, just in the sense that when interest groups go and, and bargain for public policy, Typically, they're not looking out for the long run. What they're looking for is some short run, you know, regulatory barrier to entry for competitors or a tax break or a subsidy or something like that. So when we see people actually enter the political process, they're not thinking in the long run like Buchanan would hope that they would. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just the, the sort of mechanisms of, of access and political power you're talking about if you can get a short run benefit that gets you um that you can then take that and turn it into power and influence to to then uh get more benefits in the future you know the the idea of uh hey we'll be better off in the long run if uh you know if i don't exploit others and they don't exploit me you know that that breaks down if i can if I can change my my short run exploitation, if I can exploit others in the short run to gain political power to exploit them more, as long as I'm always on top, um, you know, I I have no incentive to to fix the system for um, for you know a, a hypothetical future where everyone is better off or where where the majority are better off if I'm in the small group that wins under the current system. Yeah, that's likely to be the case. And I, I mean, I just throw out an example to you, and I don't know if this is a good example, but the General Electric Company seemed to be one of those companies that was playing that political game. They managed to lower their taxes. They got tax credits for like um, they're making the windmills that generate electricity and they had the wind tax credits. And Jeffrey Immelt, when he was uh, CEO of General Electric, was a close associate with Barack Obama. He was one of Barack Obama's economic advisors. Uh, so sort of playing that political game and worked out pretty well for General Electric for a while. But, you know, General Electric uh, has had a tough couple of years recently. Now, I don't know if that's really a good example, but I mean, sort of, you know, maybe it looks like General Electric was playing that short run game and it worked out for him for a while. But in the long run, uh, you know, they, like I say, they've suffered over the past couple of years. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you know any um, any examples of uh, companies or groups that have have done consistently well that have, uh, you know, managed to wield power and, and continue to wield power? for their benefit uh, over over a really long period or uh, just unusually long, maybe? Well, it seems like the banking industry has done pretty well. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were, uh, if you go back several decades, pretty serious barriers to entry uh, into banking. Uh, there's heavy uh, uh, banking, uh, banking regulation now that makes it difficult for smaller firms to compete in the banking industry. And if you look at the Occupy Wall Street movement, uh, I mean, basically, you know, that was against the, the Wall Street fat cats uh, that you had when the recession came along in 2008. You had the housing market collapse. Uh, a lot of people had mortgages. They were underwater in their mortgages. Uh, so they couldn't sell their homes and pay off their mortgages. They got foreclosed. They're out on the street. That's the 99 percent. And then... Um, the Federal Reserve, Congress, what do they do? They come in and they bail out the banks. They bail out the 1%. Uh, and the, um, the banking industry seems to have done pretty well just as far as regulatory uh, protection, yeah, maybe for a century. Mm, yeah. I mean, although after 2008, there would, have, there would seem to have been, you know, reforms, you know, it, it, some might even say a moral panic trying to, rein in finance and and uh stop uh 
you know, stop in particular uh, lending to uh, risky, risky borrowers. Um, but, uh, but I mean, there, there's, there's some debate uh, to, as to what extent uh, that, that really hurt the, you know, the big firms in the banking industry. Yeah. And the, and the big firms seem to be doing pretty well and they did get that big bailout from the fed uh, in the Obama mm-hmm. administration. So that, you know, it seems like a pretty good uh, example of the political connections there between the economic elite, the political elite. We bail out the one percent, the ninety-nine percent. They're left to try to make do on their own. Mm. Right, and uh, I mean, you know, things like the the bailout, but also the the payment of interest on reserves at the Fed. That was kind of a uh, you know a, a handout to to those companies and and one that disincentivize them from uh from from lending sort of effectively uh maybe i mean it's a it's a whole other topic but there uh, there was a lot going on there and it and it does seem like they they've done quite well consistent with what you'd expect from uh from a uh, group that that wields significant political influence yeah i th- i think it's a good example mhm do you have any sort of um overall recommendations like if if someone has listened to this whole conversation they 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 feel like they they understand some of the the problems of political capitalism and you know the diagnosis of sort of things things that are going wrong you know but what what uh should people do or or what uh in the long run would you would you hope that people would do to sort of reduce the the burdens of of having a sort of crony capitalist system yeah, I guess I mean one thing I would I would hope is that people would be generally aware of the of the threat. Uh, one thing that I hear a lot from supporters of of free markets uh, is the threat of socialism. Uh, you know, the creeping socialism. We got to get Bernie Sanders these days and Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, and uh, we we see the ideas of socialism in the air and you go back to the 20th century and there was that uh, the cold war era with the capitalist democracies against the socialist dictatorships you think about hayek's book the road to serfdom well hayek says the road to serfdom is socialism and so we you know people who are supporters of markets a lot of times look at socialism as a threat to capitalism but really the biggest threat to market capitalism is not coming from the socialists it's coming from capitalists and uh, that's one lesson i think is in this idea of political capitalism it's the capitalists who are threatening market capitalism and replacing it with a a political capitalism uh, so th- that's one idea that i like to get across is that threat that comes from capitalists undermining the capitalist system. And typically, you know, if you hear somebody say, uh, I'm a supporter of big business or, uh, you know, this is a business friendly policy, typically something that's pro business is anti free market. I mean, subsidies, tax mm-hmm. breaks. Oh, this is good for business. Pro business policies are typically anti free market. And so I think we need to recognize that and recognize the threat that capitalists themselves uh, pose to free market capitalism. And Schumpeter was very aware of this in capitalism, socialism, and democracy. Although he actually saw socialism as the bigger threat. You know, he, but Schumpeter asked the question in capitalism, socialism, and democracy. He says, can capitalism survive? No, I don't think so. And the reason he gave is that the people who benefited most from the capitalist system wouldn't stand up to support it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, to sort of rephrase that, that being pro business is, um, in a sense, being pro incumbent business, businesses that currently exist and wield uh, power and have a lot of revenue. Whereas being pro market, you know, part of part of having a, a a free market is is you have this churn. You know, new new businesses replace the old ones. You you don't necessarily have all you know all the big businesses being outcompeted by lots of small businesses there's sometimes the larger scale is more efficient but you know you you have 
the businesses that were big and successful 10 years ago having to deal with upstarts entering their their market and and upsetting the balance and uh you know many many times those incumbents will will try to sort of block that process yeah and i i definitely see uh see uh, about the the statement of you know the people who benefit will not advocate for it for for you know you you look at the the companies that market um guy fox masks to to so that people can you know buy them and and go protest against uh capitalism you know that there's a market there so they serve it but uh you know if, the, if those pe- if their customers had their way i'm sure they they would uh lose all the all the profit they earned from selling the masks yeah you know i mean Schumpeter talked about creative destruction but the economic elite those are the people who are being destroyed by creative destruction so you know if you're on top right now uh the market process uh you have to be competitive and there is the possibility of that creative destruction and one result is the people the economic elite who have those political connections They'll go to uh, the political system. They'll go to their legislators and look for regulatory barriers to entry. They'll look for subsidies for their firm. They'll look for tax breaks, uh, all policies that are anti-free market, pro-business policies that are anti-free market. Mm-hmm. Do you have any closing thoughts, any sort of uh, anything we didn't get to do you, that you think maybe ties this conversation together? No, I, I think we've covered things pretty well. I mean, one thing I would I would emphasize that we don't think about enough is that the biggest threat to capitalism comes from the capitalists themselves. Uh, it's not the socialists; it's the capitalists who are undermining the system from within because of their political connections. And uh, I would also emphasize that one of the things I I, I I bring out in my book is the theoretical foundation for understanding political capitalism has been around for a long time. It's not really novel. It's the public choice theory. It's the elite theory. The coast theorem comes into play pretty strongly. And what hasn't been done is combining those theories, looking at those theories together and seeing the implications of those theories together. And that's what builds the theory of political capitalism. Mm hmm. Well, my guest today has been Randall Holcomb. Randall, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Thank you very much, Garrett. I've enjoyed talking with you. And a final note to the audience, the book is entitled Political Capitalism, How Economic and Political Power is Made and Maintained, and a link to it at economicsdetective.com. So one final thanks, Randall, and uh, I'll let you go. Thank you, Garrett. Thanks for listening to Economics Detective Radio. If you want to engage in a conversation about the show, head on over to Facebook where we've got the Economics Detective Facebook group. That's Economics Detective on Facebook. And if you want to support the show, we have a Patreon page. You can find the link on economicsdetective.com. Patreon allows you to make a small, regular donation per episode that increases the marginal benefit to me of producing more episodes. I know some people do a monthly fee, but I want the incentives to be aligned properly so I can uh, push myself to keep making content to push out to you and the other people who listen to it. So thanks for listening. Um, Find us on Facebook. And if you love the show, consider becoming a Patreon supporter. I'll be back next week with another episode.